Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by the word adage. A proverb or short statement expressing a general truth? Yep. Do you have a favorite? I do. In fact, I base my existence on this one. Oh? If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. Safe should open easily. Two turns right. Stop at 32. Three turns left. Stop at 16. Get away from that safe, Carter. Uh, I was just checking on some tickets that I left in the safe tonight, Mr. Thompson. Carter, you've been a cashier with this railroad for 15 years. How could you think of doing such a thing? Well, what are you talking about? You've been gambling rather heavily these past few weeks, Carter. You decided to let the railroad recoup your losses. Well, stay where you are. I'm calling the police. Oh, no, you're not. Put down that bar, you fool. All right, I'll put it down. How are you feeling now, Carter? A little better, Sergeant Evans. I can't see very well, of course. I I broke my glasses in the struggle with the killer, and I'm not much good without them. I hate to pour these questions at you when you're not up to par, Carter, but it's important that you help us immediately. I'll do anything to help the police find the man who killed Mr. Thompson. Good. Now, you say that you and Thompson came down here to prepare some ticket sales records for the railroad. Yes. About what time was that? I should say about 9 o'clock. About what time would you say the thief came in? About an hour later. We heard the door open, and when we turned around from the safe... He was standing near the door, pointing a gun at us. What happened then? Well, he demanded we give him the money from the safe. How did the struggle begin? Well, Mr. Thompson walked straight at the thief and dared him to shoot. He was warned to stop or he'd be killed, but he continued to go right at him. The thief lost his nerve or something, for as Mr. Thompson made a sudden lunge at him, he didn't shoot, but instead hit him sharply over the head with the butt of his pistol. I ran forward immediately and grappled with the thief. And it landed a blow in my jaw and I fell to the floor. I got up as soon as I could, but I heard him starting his car outside the office. Did you run outside? Yes. The car was just pulling away, but I managed to get the first five numbers on the license plate. I wrote them down on this slip of paper. Oh, yeah, yeah. This will be a big help in the evidence to be presented at court. I'll be happy to testify. That's a wise idea, Mr. Carter. A murderer always should at his own trial. What clue did Sergeant Evans uncover that led him to accuse the railroad cashier of murder? In just a moment, we'll know, but first... Okay, there's another one where we know the guy is guilty as sin. Yes, but what was his slip-up? I can honestly say I have no idea. Perhaps there was something in his story we missed? Probably, but it sounded like a pretty good lie to me. Agreed. And of course you know what a good lie should sound like. Message, BG? None that I am aware of, other than you are a lying, two-faced pile of... That's pretty harsh. Well, I was going to add a substantially cool idiot. Well, okay then. And now, back to our story. Are you accusing me of murdering Mr. Thompson? Yes, Carter. There was one slip in your story that gave you away. You admitted to me only a few minutes ago that you lost your glasses in the struggle with the thief and that you were helpless without them. Yet you managed to run outside the building, 
and jot down several numbers of a license plate on a moving car in the middle of the night. No, Carter, there was no thief. But there was a murderer. Yourself. I totally missed the glasses thing. As did I. It even makes a bit of sense. Agreed. But you have to take into account that thinking of everything is nearly impossible. Yep. Hence that old adage. Oh, what is that? There is no such thing as the perfect murder. No, BG. I was referring to never use a hatchet to remove a fly from your friend's forehead. Wrong. You truly are an idiot. BG, I'm going to take that as a compliment. Hello and welcome to the podcast. We have a full show for you today. We will review the audiobook Stories of the Golden West. We have a creepy ghost encounter from Rod in Illinois. And then we head to the early 1800s and travel with Lewis and Clark. Had a lot of fun putting this one together. So let's get started with... Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks, and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So, what am I listening to? Stories of the Golden West. The period from 1940 to 1960 has been called the Golden Age of the Western. It is epitomized by the work of several prominent authors. These include Louis L'Amour, Max Brand, Zane Grey, and Jack Schaefer. Jack was best known for the 1949 novel Shane, which was voted the greatest Western novel ever written. There were many more, of course, but when you think of the Western, those are the names that spring to mind. So, what is our book all about? Stories of the Golden West is a collection of classic Western short stories written by some of the greats I mentioned. One of the stories in the book is Tappan's Burrow by Zane Grey. Prospecting was a lonely business for Tappan, but his burrow, Jeannet, was good company. She knew the trails and water holes better than Tappan. She tracked with him faithful, his only friend, and he repays her with a final supreme effort of heart, will, and spirit. Here's a clip from that story. Tappan gazed down upon the newly born little burrow with something of pity and consternation. It was not a vigorous offspring of the redoubtable Jenny, champion of all the numberless burrows he had driven in his desert prospecting years. He could not leave it there to die. Surely it was not strong enough to follow its mother, and to kill it was beyond him. Poor little devil, soliloquized Tappan. Reckon neither Jenny nor I wanted it to be born. I'll have to hold up in this camp a few days. You never can tell what a burrow will do. It might fool us and grow strong all of a sudden. Whereupon Tappan left Jenny and her tiny gray lop-eared baby to themselves, and leisurely set about making permanent camp. The water at this oasis was not much to his liking, but it was drinkable, and he felt he must put up with it. For the rest, the oasis was desirable enough as a camping site. Desert wanderers like Tappan favored the lonely water holes. This one was up inside the bold brow of the Chocolate Mountains, where Rocky Wall met the desert sand, and a green patch of Palo Verdes and Mesquites proved the presence of water. It had a magnificent view— 
down a many-leagued slope of desert growths, across the dark belt of green and shining strip of red that marked the Rio Colorado, and on to the upflung Arizona land, range lifting to range, until the saw-toothed peaks notched the blue sky. Locked in the iron fastness of these desert mountains was gold. Tappan, if he had any calling, was a prospector. But the lure of gold did not bind him to this wandering life any more than the freedom of it. He had never made a rich strike. About the best he could ever do was to dig enough gold to grubstake himself for another prospecting trip into some remote corner of the American desert. Tappan knew the arid southwest from San Diego to the Pecos River, and from Picacho on the Colorado to the Tonto Basin. Few prospectors had the strength and endurance of Tappan. He was a giant in build, and at thirty-five had never yet reached the limit of his physical force. With hammer and pick and magnifying glass, Tappan scaled the bare ridges. He was not an expert in testing minerals. He knew he might easily pass by a rich vein of ore, but he did his best, sure at least that no prospector could get more than he out of the pursuit of gold. Tappan was more of a naturalist than a prospector, and more of a dreamer than either. Many were the idle moments that he sat staring down the vast reaches of the valleys, or watching some creature of the wasteland, or marveling at the vivid hues of desert flowers. Tappan waited two weeks at this oasis for Jenny's baby burrow to grow strong enough to walk. The very day that Tappan decided to break camp, he found signs of gold at the head of a wash above the oasis. Quite by chance, as he was looking for his burrow, he struck his pick into a place no different from a thousand others there and hid into a pocket of gold. He cleaned the pocket out before sunset, the richer for several thousand dollars. Yeah, "'You brought me luck,' said Tappan to the little gray burrow, staggering around its mother. "'Your name is Jennet. You're Tappan's burrow, and I reckon he'll stick to you.' Jennet belied the promise of her birth. Like a seed in fertile ground, she grew. Winter and summer Tappan patrolled the sand beach from one trading post to another, and his burrow traveled with him. Jennet had an especially good training. Her mother had happened to be a remarkably good burrow before Tappan had bought her. Tappan had patience. He found leisure to do things, and he had something of pride in Jennet. Whenever he happened to drop into Ehrenberg or Yuma or any freighting station, some prospector always tried to buy Jennet. She grew as large as a medium-sized mule, and a three-hundred-pound pack was no load to discommode her. Tappan, in common with most lonely wanderers of the desert, talked to his burrow. As the years passed, this habit grew until Tappan would talk to Jennet just to hear the sound of his voice. Perhaps that was all that kept him human. Janet, you're worthy of a happier life, Tappan would say as he unpacked her after a long day's march over the barren land. You're a ship of the desert. Here we are, with grub and water, a hundred miles from any camp. And what but you could have fetched me here? No horse, no mule, no man. Nothing but a camel. And so I call you ship of the desert. But for you and your kind, Janet, there'd be no prospectors and few gold mines. Reckon the desert would still be an unknown waste. You're a great beast of burden, Janet, and there's no one to sing your praise. And of a golden sunrise, when Janet was packed and ready to face the cool, sweet fragrance of the desert, Tappan was wont to say, Go along with you, Janet. The morning's fine. Look at the mountains yonder calling us. It's only a step down there, all purple and violet. It's the life for us, my burrow, and Tappan's as rich as if all these sands were pearls. But sometimes, at sunset, when the way had been long and hot and rough, Tappan would bend his shaggy head over Janet and talk in a different mood. Another day gone, Janet, another journey ended, and Tappan is only older, wearier, sicker. There's no reward for your faithfulness. I'm only a desert rat living from hole to hole, no home, no face to see, only the ghost of memories. Some sunset, Janet, we'll reach the end of the trail, and Tappan's bones will bleach in the sands, and no one will know or care. Pretty amazing when it's all said and done. As I mentioned, this is a collection. There are three stories. Tappan's Burrow by Zane Gray. You just heard a clip from that one. Jargon M by Max Brand and The Trail to Crazy Man by Louis L'Amour. Each of these stories are great, and care was taken to narrate them with style befitting a classic western. 
To call these short stories is a bit of a misnomer. The total length of the book is over nine hours, so really there are three novellas, each written by the best of the best Western authors. Now, one thing I should point out is that this is book three of a series of seven books. For whatever reasons, books one, two, four, and six have not been made into audiobooks but are available to read. I have not listened to five and seven yet, but they are on my wish list. Overall, book three was exciting, entertaining, and captured my interest from the get-go. I highly recommend it if you love a good Western. And in reality, don't we all? Now, if that appeals to you in any way, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories and you can have Stories of the Golden West, book three, for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook in 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out the service. This also grants you access to the included catalog, which is constantly updated with new stuff. So, to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. These are your stories. Special edition. Welcome to These Are Your Stories. You might be asking, how is this different from the other segment? The answer is simple. These are special. But what makes them that way? Again, the answer is simple. They deserve special treatment. It may be the content of the story or how the story was obtained. Or it could be that the storyteller himself or herself is actually here in person. No matter the how, why, or where, what you'll hear in this segment is going to be special. Our story for this week is sent in by Roderick Quarles. Rod hails from the great state of Illinois, home of the Cubs and our very own Sylvia Schultz. It might be one of the strangest we've had on the show. Rod's experience is the stuff of both nightmares and wonders. It takes place in the town of Forreston, Illinois. It has both physical and vocal elements. Not to give too much away, but trains are involved as well. And as you already know about me, I love a good train story. Rod has titled this one, Will You Play With Me? So I live in Illinois, and one of the houses I lived in was haunted. I remember as a kid growing up that the doors upstairs would open and close by themselves. Sometimes you would hear footsteps in the hallway and attic. But that's nothing all that scary. However, what I would experience at my friend's house changed how I would view the paranormal and ghosts for the rest of my life. A lot of my friend's houses were haunted as well. One lived in a house that part of it was actually an old train car. Behind that was this creepy old brick house that no one lived in. Rumors said that it was the original train station that served as a stop back in the early 1900s. Old tracks, signs, etc. were scattered all around the area. I would hang out at his house every day after school until my folks got home. A lot of strange stuff happened there. The door to his room would randomly open, either really slow or fast. Outside his room by the front door, his dog would sit all day long and stare at the corner, then bark towards the ceiling for no reason. Editor's note, I can't tell you how many stories we've had on the show that has that very element. One day, my friend was gone with his family. It was his birthday and his mom asked if I could watch the house for the next week. She said that I could have a few people over to keep me company. So that first day, five of us chilled and played video games. Three left and it was just me and one friend. We were playing Madden on the PS3 and all of a sudden I heard, Will you play with me? 
I thought it was my friend and said, We're already playing. What do you mean? He said, I didn't say anything. I was confused and then I heard it again. Will you play with me? I look at my friend and he says again that he didn't say anything. I said, Dude, I swear you asked me twice if I'd play with you. We continued playing and a few minutes later, we both hear it. We looked at each other, confused. I paused the game and again it came. And again, like ten minutes later. Will you play with me? I walked over to a toy box that was by the TV and in front of it sat this toy cash register. Will you play with me? <laughs> That's what it was. I picked it up and it repeated over and over again. Will you play with me? I examined the thing. The battery cover was missing and it had no batteries installed. We freaked out. I dropped the curse thing and ran out of the room to the garage. I was standing there when I felt cold. A breeze kicked up out of nowhere. I hustled out of there, slammed the door behind me, and went back to the living room where my friend was. Then, out of the garage, screaming, loud it came, Will you play with me? We looked at each other and got up to leave. I was putting my shoes on when the front door opened in front of us and a gust of cold air brushed by. It was crazy. We went home and left the ghost to itself. A couple days later, we were back in my friend's room. It was 10 p.m. and we were just chilling. I asked when we were leaving. It was late and I was getting tired. Well, the door opened and closed three times. The last time it flew open and hit the wall hard and a deep voice said, It's time to go. We walked out of the room into the living room and then the front door flew open. My friend looked at me and said, Yeah, it's time to go, bro. We ran outside with the family dog in tow and left. I didn't go back for a few days. When my friend got home from his birthday vacation, I told him and his mom what had happened. It turns out that his little brother has a ghost friend that he talks to. His name was Tyler and that he died on a train when he was only five years old. I never went back to that house. Kind of crazy. A few weeks later, the family ended up moving out because, I guess, everything got much worse. I know most people won't believe this story and... That's okay. When I got older, I tried to do some research on the whole thing. I found a lot of stuff about the railroad history, first settlers, and the indigenous people of the area. But nothing about a five-year-old boy that died on a train. Roderick Quarles, Forreston, Illinois. Well, what can I say about that? That has to be one of the craziest stories that we've ever had on the show. I too had to do some research on the town of Forreston. What I came up with is this. In the spring of 1825, Oliver W. Kellogg blazed a trail north through the prairie, passing near the future West Grove settlement, which is a few miles east of Forreston. A year later, John Bowles opened a shorter trail which passed through White Oak Grove, a half a mile west of Forreston, the location of the nearest log cabin to the town. Secondary trails linked these major routes of pioneer travel and intersected at this location. Early settlers included immigrants from the lowlands of Ostfriesland in northern Germany. Their narrative accounts recalled this location as the site of the first brick house and store in Forreston. Founder George Hewitt plotted the town in the fall of 1854 and built his brick home two blocks west of this location. The Illinois Central Railroad laid tracks to Forreston in the winter of that year, which led to the growth of a town. So, there you have it. Lots of stuff that support your story, Rod. Thank you for sharing it with us. You gotta wonder if that old brick house in the back of your friend's home is one of the ones mentioned in that blurb. Who knows? That's it for this time. 
If you have a story that you want to share like Rod did, head to the main website at bronzeamazingstories.com, click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story comes from the radio miniseries, Horizons West. This was a 13-installment docudrama which traced the movements of the famous Lewis and Clark expedition from 1803 to 1806. While there was a lot of imbuement to the stories, for the most part they were historically accurate. What I'm going to play for you is episode 1, titled, Mr. Jefferson's Dream. President Thomas Jefferson's charter to the Army Captains Meriwether Lewis and William Clark was to trace the origin of the Missouri River from St. Louis to Great Falls of Montana, and eventually beyond. With the announcement of the securing of the Louisiana Purchase of July 4, 1803, Jefferson finally felt secure in scheduling the exploration. The first thing the two did was establish Camp Dubois. It was located on the eastern shore of the Mississippi near Hartford, Illinois. They began to undertake the provisioning needed for the expedition. Their biggest problem? How do you keep this whole thing secret while doing it? What you're going to hear is that process. This first aired in November of 1965. Hang around after, and I will give you some more information on this series. Now, let's listen to some history. The American West. Once it could have been the British, Spanish, or even the Russian West. It became American primarily because of the explorations of two young army officers, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Their pioneering journey stands as one of the great achievements in the history of the United States. Captain Lewis. Hello, Sergeant. Welcome back, sir. Hope you had a tolerable trip. Well, I took a new trail from Detroit and ran into an Indian situation that looked tight for a little while, but you know me, Sergeant. Paymaster First Infantry can't let the men down. Here. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Who won the election? Jefferson. Noble Sir Thomas, the champion of the common man. Good old Mr. Jefferson. He made it. He made it. Uh, Republicans are all alike. No control. What was that, Sergeant? <clears throat> are you criticizing me or Mr. Jefferson? Just giving an opinion, sir. What this country needs is a ruling class. Sergeant, you're an idiot. Three cheers for Tom Jefferson! What's going on here? I'm starting to work. Oh, <clears throat> you, Lewis. Yes, sir. The sergeant just told me Mr. Jefferson was elected president. And you're letting everybody know you're friends with him, is that it? I voted for him, if that's what you mean. No, not exactly, Captain. There's a letter for you from him in my office. Come in. A letter from Mr. Jefferson? Looks to me like a personal letter. Well, our families are neighbors in Virginia. Here. It came by special messenger day before yesterday. Thank you, sir. This is surprised to hear from him when he's busy taking over such a big job. Well, Captain, good news or bad? Dear Lieutenant Lewis, <laughs> I'll have to tell him I made Captain, huh, sir? In view of my recent election to the presidency of the United States, I find that I will require a private secretary... Your tact and social adaptability, your knowledge of the Western country of the Army, has rendered it desirable for public as well as private purposes that you should be engaged in that office. If you accept, please obtain approbation from General Wilkinson and repair to the presidential mansion, Washington City. What do you think of that, Colonel? I am to be the new private secretary to the president. I don't understand it, Lewis. You, a secretary? Why not, sir? Well, if your written reports are any indication, you don't have a hand. You have a rooster scratch. 
And you can't spell. Come, Captain. Why would the President want you for a secretary? Very simple, Colonel. He likes me. Horizons West, the continued story of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Now, with Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark, listen to Chapter One, Mr. Jefferson's Dream. Years before he was elected president in 1800, Thomas Jefferson had dreamed of exploring the unknown lands west of the Mississippi River. Unknown lands that were said to contain wonders such as a mountain of pure salt and prehistoric mammoth. Now that he had been inaugurated, Jefferson was in a position to realize his dreams by sending what he liked to call a core of discovery into the West. Because of certain political and commercial rivalries, such an expedition would have to be kept secret as long as possible and would need superlative leadership. After considering a number of young men, Jefferson finally selected the leader, Meriwether Lewis, and had ensured the secrecy of the choice by offering him the job of private secretary to the president. My name is Meriwether Lewis, and I'm making what the colonel has called rooster scratches in my journal. In March of 1801, I was 26 years old, a captain in the 1st Infantry and paymaster for the regiment. I liked Army life, even though being paymaster meant I had to travel constantly through the wilderness parts of Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, and along the Mississippi frontier in order to pay the scattered troops of the regiment. I managed to make the rounds about twice a year. Anyway, on March 6, 1801, the day after I received my letter from Mr. Jefferson, I left the Army Depot in Pittsburgh on my way to Washington, the new federal city. The spring rains made the roads a slew of mud, and it took me over two weeks to reach the White House. Mr. Jefferson had gone for a short vacation to Monticello, but he left instructions for me to move into his quarters, where I would receive free food and lodging and a salary of $600 per year, much better than captain's pay, I might add. So I unpacked and tried to get settled before the president returned. <laughs> A little more of the Boeuf Bourguignon, Meriwether. Boeuf Bourguignon. I was about to call it the best beef stew I ever ate. <laughs> Have some more. Mr. President, I've had two helpings already. Where did you ever find such a cook? In Paris. When I was there as United States Ambassador, I persuaded him to come home with me. Now, shall we uh, take our brandy into the library? I suppose you're anxious to know a little about your duties. Well, frankly, sir, I've been wondering why you chose me for the job. For the sake of morale, let's have one thing understood. Friendship had nothing to do with it. Yes, sir. Surely you could have found someone with a more impressive hand, and surely you had more qualified applicants. Mm -hmm. For a secretarial position, Meriwether, all of the applicants were better qualified than you. Then I don't understand. Well, think of the position as a sort of aide-de-camp. After all, secretary is only an official title. Like a general's aide? Exactly. And not a secretary. <laughs> I like to write my own letters, and I can, with either hand. And uh, later, I'll show you a copying machine I've invented. Now, all I really need is a file clerk, and that will leave you free to handle certain confidential matters for me. Yes, sir. I, uh, I wonder if you remember, nine years ago, you asked me if you could go on Andre Michaud's scientific expedition into the West. You were too young then, but now... Now you're as qualified as any man to lead a similar expedition. Even if I fail like me, show, I couldn't think of anything I'd rather do. I thought you'd feel that way about it. Now, you would explore the Missouri clear to its mountain headwaters, and then go on to the Pacific. If it is America's destiny to be a great nation, she has to go beyond the Mississippi. Your expedition may or may not be the first step in such expansion, and in securing our borders against the British and the French. Oh, I don't know yet. We have to let things develop a bit more, but I want you to think about such a trip anyway. Yes, sir. Oh, well, uh, have you seen this? 
I was admiring it. It's a very handsome telescope. I'm trying to figure out how to double this refracting space in order to add light and magnitude. May I have a closer look? Scarcely a day went by when I didn't think about the expedition. Soon I was calling it the core of discovery, as Mr. Jefferson did. I studied, I prepared. About a year later, the president called me into his office. Come in. Good morning, Mr. President. You wanted to speak with me? Oh, oh yes, yes. Um, I thought I'd tell you to step up your preparations for the core of discovery. Step it up? I will, sir, with all possible dispatch. Well, devote full time to it. I don't have to remind you of the necessity for secrecy. Don't even tell your mother. <laughs> Least of all, my mother. She'd have it all over town. I, uh, I think you ought to know I'm secretly trying to buy New Orleans. Now that Louisiana is French again, that's the only way we can keep Mississippi open to American commerce. As long as Napoleon controls the river, we can't think of Western expansion. Sure, sir. Napoleon is almost sure to attack England. Now, part of British retaliation would probably include the occupation of Louisiana. There are no French troop contingents or Navy units in the area large enough to stop them. Can you imagine the British in our western border? We would use the Mississippi only after fighting and winning a major war, something we can't afford at present. We're to wait for news of the purchase negotiations? Oh, not at all. We'll explain your project as a scientific trip to locate the headwaters of the Mississippi. Very good, sir. Oh, if I can buy more of the New Orleans, I will. But once you're across the Mississippi and up the Missouri, we'll have won a partial victory. Also, I'd like you to get the Indian trade away from the British. You can do a lot towards that by establishing friendly relations with the tribes. Of course, you'll acquire detailed information about the route west to the mouth of the Columbia. I'm hoping the rumors are true that there's a single portage from the headwaters of the Missouri to the headwaters of the Columbia. A water route to the Western Ocean. Remember, water or land, we must have economic control of the continent. Yes, sir. We'll be outflanking Spain, France, and England all in one simple maneuver. Above all, Meriwether, the United States must grow. An expansion to the West is the natural direction. Yes, sir. Well, perhaps I'm asking too much, but uh, I hope you won't neglect the scientific side of the journey. All my adult life, I've wanted to know what lies beyond the Mississippi. I've heard so many stories, tales. People have brought me boxes of mammoth bones from there. You think of it. Actual prehistoric animals in the distant west. I wish I could go myself. I really do. I've been east to Europe. But you know that I've never been more than 50 miles west of Albemarle County. On January 18, 1803, Mr. Jefferson sent a secret message to Congress asking for an allocation of funds for the expedition. Congress complied, and I started gathering equipment and supplies, plus trying to cram navigation into my head at night. The more I studied, the more I thought of William Clark, who was a genius at navigation. Billy would be a great asset to the Corps of Discovery, but he was also a friend of mine, perhaps my best friend. And I couldn't pick his brains and take all the glory for myself. Maybe Billy could become my co-leader. I went to Mr. Jefferson to find out. Come in. May I speak to you, sir? Oh, of course, Meriwether, of course. Close the door and sit down. It's about the uh, science side of the trip, sir. Well, I'm glad you're giving it thought. Mr. President, I'm not possessed of enough learning to Who be... Who is Meriwether? Whoever knows enough... However, you're strong in botany, zoology, the study of minerals. Your knowledge of geography and navigation is sound. But not sound enough, sir. Do you remember William Clark, the younger brother of General George Rogers Clark? Billy, of course I remember him. A good boy. Well, Billy and I have been friends for a long time. In 1797, he was my company commander. In the next year, he resigned to go home to Kentucky and help on the family farm. He's 32 now. He's a first-rate soldier and frontiersman and a genius at cartography and geography. I think I could talk him into going with us. Mm -hmm. Might be a good idea. You'd be more efficient with Billy to help. Go ahead. Enlist him as your aide. Not as my aide, sir. Co-leader. 
same rank, same pay, same allotment of glory, or disgrace. Are you that sure of him? I don't follow you, sir. Well, do you know him that well? Usually, having two leaders is the quickest route to dissension and failure. Not with Billy. If he can't help us, he won't have any part of it. I'd advise you to think it over carefully. I have, sir. We need Billy Clark. The decision is yours. You're the leader of the expedition. Oh, the crops look mighty fine. I'll be able to pay off a few more of the old debts. There you are, Mr. Clark. Hello, York. You look like you've been running. Yes, sir. Got a letter for you. Jenna George says it might be important. Ah, maybe, York. My old friend Meriwether Lewis at the White House. White House? Mr. Jefferson's house? Pursuant to the President's wishes, I am taking an expedition to explore the Missouri and the Columbia River Valleys, eventually ending on the shores of the Pacific Sea. I hope to return to Washington on one of the trading vessels that call now and then at the mouth of the Columbia. If there is anything in this enterprise which would induce you to participate with me in its fatigues, dangers, and its honors, believe me, there is no man on earth with whom I should feel equal pleasure in sharing them as with yourself. What do you think of that, York? He wants me to go with him. Well, I'd better find George. George! Uh, George! What's wrong? York, what's the matter with Billy? Uh, well, sir... Uh, uh, this letter, George, read it. All right, all right, all right, sir. Well, from Missouri, come here. Huh? Why? Well, well, well. Billy, seems to me there's a great deal over here for a young man of ability and energy. Billy, accepted one. Uh, well, what about the farm? You can't manage it all by yourself. Oh, crops are first rate this year. Jonathan, I'll hire some help while you're gone. Go with Captain Lewis. I'm glad you feel that way. I'll get our gear in order, sir. I'll get us some horses to ride. Us? I don't remember that Captain Lewis invited you. I'm not letting you go into that wilderness alone. Clark sent me an acceptance as soon as he could and then left for Louisville to begin recruiting under instructions to enlist for a voyage up the Mississippi rather than the Missouri. Secrecy was still important. I left quietly for Pittsburgh in the Army Supply Depot to check off equipment I'd ordered. Everything was ready, including a new kind of air gun or cannon which would shoot a slug through four inches of wood. Only the boats were slow in construction. The workmen were incorrigible drunkards, and the more I tried to hurry them, the longer they took. But then I met Scanlon. Oh, the devils, why do they stall around? What do they gain from such infernal slow motion? When I assume a task, something always seems to go wrong. Like those men over there, the sodden lumps. Why must I have all the problems? I wonder if I'll ever get started. I have to stop talking to myself. I have to control these fits of depression. Too many of them to mean the failure of the trip. I must stop. Hey, boy, what are you blocking at? You're huge. You're big as a pony. I'm sorry, boy. I don't want to disturb you. Ah, he won't hurt you. He's just saying good day to you. What's his name? Harlan. After me, brother. God bless him. He's a new convert. Uh, not me, brother. The dog. Weighs nigh on to 200 pounds. Really? Oh, he's a fine man. <laughs> my brother was a fine man, too. As big a man as cannon as a dog. Hell, <laughs> quiet down, my boy, and stop nuzzling the gentleman. It's rude of you. <laughs> well, he ain't much for strangers, sir, but he likes you. Hello there, Dodd. Nice, cannon. What do you take for him? I'm going on a long trip. I need a beast like him. Well, I... I, I never thought much of telling this cannon, but, uh... He does keep reminding me of my dead brother, and it ain't good to be kept in sorrow. I tell you what. Twenty dollars, and he's yours. Twenty dollars? You must be out of your head. No dog's worth that much. This one is. Twenty dollars, that's me final price.
<laughs> All right. All right, I may be a fool, but you've just sold a dog. Two weeks later, the boats were ready. With seven soldiers, a river pilot, three young men engaged on a trial basis, and Scannon, I started down the Ohio. The trip downriver was difficult at first. Several times we had to have the heavily laden boats pulled over shoals by oxen. The local settlers charged exorbitantly for such services. But as the river grew wider and deeper, the trip became easier. We stopped at Fort Massac, where I was fortunate enough to meet George Drouillard. He was known to be an experienced man among the Indians, a good woodsman and boatman, a crack shot. I engaged him as an interpreter since he didn't particularly want to enlist as a soldier. And then we took to the boats again. Good weather made it a relatively easy trip to Louisville, where I was to meet Billy Clark. Easy with a pole. Bring her in gently. Easy. Line. Line. Tire tight. Billy? Hey, Billy! Fairweather! Fairweather, you sure looking fine. You put on a few pounds at the president's table, didn't you? <laughs> I guess I did at that. It's good to see you. And to see you. Say, hey, did you ever find a dog like that? He's a monster. That's Cannon. I bought him in Pittsburgh. Cannon? Here, boy, here. <laughs> Say hello to Captain Clark, Scannon. <laughs> he sure is big. I'm glad he's on our side. Excuse me, Captain Clark. Jello George and Mr. Jonathan wanted you to be sure to bring Captain Lewis home for dinner. Did I hear the word dinner? You sure did. I accept. George Driar can take charge for me here. Oh, uh, excuse me. York, meet Captain Lewis, my old friend. Meriwether, this is my man, York. I'm uh, taking him along. It's a pleasure, York. I'm honored, sir. I told York he'd be treated like the others as long as he pulled his own weight. With those muscles, you shouldn't have any trouble pulling twice your weight, York. <laughs> but all joking aside, as a man, you're on the same level as every one of us in the Corps of Discovery. Thank you, sir. We had dinner that night with my brothers, General George and Jonathan. And the next morning, we left for St. Louis. The boatmen were expert, and in what seemed like no time at all, we had angled into the Mississippi. We headed north. Several days later, we stopped along the eastern bank of the river opposite St. Louis, where we would set up our winter camp. Billy handled the training of the men and ran the base camp, which left me free to range up and down the river in the surrounding countryside, gathering the last of the supplies, information, and what have you. I ran into some trouble with the local gentry who style themselves private agents for Indian tribes. These voracious middlemen were responsible for most of the delays we experienced that first winter when we had to deal with the Indians of the Illinois Territory. At Fort Kaskaskia, I met more trouble in the shape of an obstinate commanding officer, Captain Bissell, whom I had encountered several times during my tenure as paymaster for the 1st Infantry. All you want is for me to transfer my two best men, Sergeant John Ordway and Private Patrick Gass, to your unit. Why, Lewis? Why? I told you once, Captain, Ordway is an experienced non-com. Gass is an expert carpenter and boat builder. The answer is no. But I'll be in boats for months. Suppose I need to make emergency repairs or uh, build a new boat when I'm hundreds of miles from any base. No, Lewis. My men stay here with me. Do you mind telling me Why? I refuse to weaken the potential of my command to make it easier on you. Since you won't cooperate, I have no recourse but to give you this letter. All Army personnel, you are hereby ordered to honor any demand made upon you by Captain Merriweather Lewis. An order from him is to be considered an order from me. Signed, Thomas Jefferson. How about that, Bessel? Is that authority enough for you? Having read Mr. Jefferson's letter, Captain Bissell gave in with much grumbling. I left Fort Kaskaskia with Ordway and Gas, going directly to our winter camp. The electrifying news had come that Napoleon had sold all of Louisiana, not just New Orleans, to the United States. Everybody was filled with an outsized excitement. Everybody but Billy Clark. 
<laughs> Great news, Meriwether. Great news. According to Jefferson's concept, Louisiana includes all the rivers of the Mississippi-Missouri system clear to their headwaters. That's thousands of miles to the western mountains. Yes. Come on, Billy. You should be as happy as I am. You should be telling the men to leave off work to celebrate. You can do that after we talk. Let's go to my tent where we can have a little privacy. All right. There we are. Go on in. Now, what's this all about? Read what our esteemed General Wilkinson has to say. Yeah, well, Mr. Clark, due to the present strict organization of the Corps of Engineers, not only would it be improper, but it is impossible to to offer you a commission as a captain. I find that the highest appointment I can give you is that of a second lieutenant in the Corps of Artillerists. Your rank, however, will have no effect on compensation received for traveling with Captain Lewis's Corps of Discovery. Second lieutenant. Billy, I promised you a captain's commission, and Mr. Jefferson did, too. I'm sure he knows nothing about this. It's all Wilkinson is doing. I feel sure of that. Billy, there's no reason to talk about the letter to anyone else. As far as I'm concerned, the only difference between us is that I'm a Captain First United States Infantry, and you're a Captain First Corps of Discovery. Being a second lieutenant on paper didn't bother me too much once I had time to get used to it. I was a captain, according to everyone but Wilkinson. At 4 p.m. on May 13, 1804, we left camp and started upriver. We had one large 55-foot keelboat and two 50-foot canoes, one white, one red. All three were packed with 44 men and more than 12,000 pounds of supplies. On shore, moving parallel to us, was our hunting detail, George Rulliard and two men. Captain Lewis would meet us at the river town of St. Charles. At the moment, he was in St. Louis at the laboratory of Dr. Antoine Saugrain, picking up small but important items for us. Three thermometers, Captain Lewis. As far as I know, the only handmade ones in all of Louisiana. Mr. Jefferson expects us to record temperatures all the way. As a scientific expedition must. When you next see His Excellency, you may tell him your thermometers were made from mercury scraped from the back of an antique Parisian mirror belonging to Madame Saugrain, and the glass from that same mirror melted down and reshaped. Ah, also tell him Madame Saugrain did not speak to me for two weeks. Two weeks? But I asked you to make the thermometers only a week ago. Oh, I beg your pardon. I, I, I'm anticipating the future. I calculate that my wife will remain silent another week. Two weeks in all, huh? Then she will explode in a tirade, and I will wish again for a sweet silence. Look, look at the matches, my friend. Take one. Scratch it briskly on the top of this stove, huh? Why, it lights immediately. Wait. I call it a friction match. Each splinter I dipped first in sulfur and then in phosphorus. Keep them dry at all costs. A thousand thanks for what you've done and for your ingenuity. I'm sorry Mrs. Sogrin is upset. Oh, she'll recover. When I see the president again, I'll tell him he owes your wife an antique French mirror. I met the expedition at St. Charles and was in time for a special visit to Farm Osage, the settlement founded by the aging Daniel Bourne. So you're moving up the Missouri and across the divide to the Pacific. Where did you hear that, sir? I hope you haven't mentioned that theory to anyone else, Mr. Bowen. <laughs> I don't think you fool the smart ones. Nobody gets together a fine expedition like this just to travel up the Mississippi. I wish I could go along. We'll make a place for you if you're serious. I, I wish it could be, but I'm 69. No, this is your high tide. Mine was years ago, back in Kentucky. Oh, one thing. They've uh, warned you about the Indians? We hear the Teton Sioux can be quarrelsome. Well, <laughs> if you underrate them to that extent, come next month and your scalp will be hanging from some Sioux lodgepole, drying. It's that bad. Along with the Arikaras, 
The Teton Sioux make up a colony of river pirates. According to how they feel, they might let you pass with only the payment of half your goods. Or they might take your goods and send you back. Or they might take your goods and kill you all. What do you advise, Mr. Bone? Be men. Do what you must. Pay, parley, or fight. But never stop being men. What old Daniel Boone told us made us realize we were facing a huge task. The Tetons flew up toward the Dakota country were only one of our obstacles, if a man took the long view. But our goal was the Pacific, and it was time we got started. I gave the high sign to Billy Clark. All right, you men, push off! We've got miles and miles to make before sundown. You have been listening to Horizons West, the continued story of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Chapter 1, Mr. Jefferson's Dream starred Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark. Featured in the cast were Don Randolph, Cliff Holland, Stan Farrar, Ben Wright, Les Tremaine, Tyler McVeigh, Bill Irwin, and Dal McKinnon. Our story was written by Carly and William Tunberg and directed by William Lally. Sound patterns by Gene Twombly. Michael Rye speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. I hope that you enjoyed that. History lessons are so much easier to follow in a story form. I don't know about you, but I learned a couple things from this one. Horizons West was produced for radio at Capitol Records Studio in Hollywood in 1963. Radio dramas didn't have much traction in the mid-60s because television was the only real medium for stories by then. However, it was finally broadcast for the Armed Forces on the Korean Network in 1965. I really couldn't find out if it got much more play than that. The series of program includes 13 half-hour broadcasts. The storylines include exciting tales of the meeting of the Teton Sioux, Sacagawea joining the expedition, dealing with horse thieves, exploring the Yellowstone River, and fighting a Blackfoot war party. All in all, some really well-known and not-so-well-known events of the Lewis and Clark adventure. Now, I don't plan to play all 13 episodes of this. In fact, I doubt I will ever play this series again. But I did want to introduce it to you. I do think it's worth your time. To this end, I will have a link in the show notes where you can listen to all 13 shows for free. Don't be fooled. There are a number of places where you can buy these shows, but they are in the public domain and there is absolutely no reason to do so. So head to the main website, click on that link, pack your bag full of beef jerky and trail mix, grab your compass, and head off with William and Meriwether to explore and chart the American West. That was episode number 596, and what a show it was, thanks to Roderick Quarles. That's one of the best stories we've ever had on the show. Remember, you too can share your story with us all. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. Bye.